Okay. The the plan for today's lecture, which focuses on the virtue of integrity, is to first uh, discuss the need for integrity. Why do we need it? What is it? And second, to discuss two basic or essential forms of integrity. And third, um, I call integrity the virtue of being virtuous. And in the last part of the talk, I'll explain what that means. Now, integrity, integrity, integrity is something everyone ought to have. In fact, it's this kind of word that gets bandied around quite a bit as meaning a virtue of some kind or another. People often use it to mean something like having morality or being honest, such as saying, he was a man of integrity. I mean, I suppose Bill Clinton lacked in integrity in this sense because he was a liar. I mean, have you all ever seen a business mission statement? I suppose so, right? Integrity shows up on these all the time. But again, in these cases, it seems to mean honesty or decency, more or less. Objectivism has a more precise uh, sense of what integrity is and why it's a virtue. Most basically, integrity means wholeness. To be integral is to be whole. A building has integrity if it holds together. And a person, in the same way, has integrity if that person holds together. Now, holding together is only noteworthy if something has elements that can come apart. The elements of a building might be its facade and its structural design, or its form and its function. But in what ways can people come apart? I mean, our heads don't detach from our shoulders in normal circumstances. We don't have trouble, usually, with our feet wandering off on their own. We come apart uh, because our thoughts need not correspond to our deeds. We can come apart because our emotions need not correspond to our rational judgment. We can come apart because our attention need not focus on our greatest values. As a value, integrity consists, as a value that is, not a virtue, but as a value, integrity consists in maintaining our unity of mind and body. Our thoughts from our minds need to match what we do with our bodies. Our feelings from our bodies and subconscious need to correspond to our judgment which is a product of consciousness. But today, I, I want to talk about integrity as a virtue. And in its most general sense, integrity is the virtue of acting on your convictions and values. Uh, it means being a person of principle and putting your money where your mouth is. Now, here's how Ayn Rand described the facts that lie behind integrity. This is from Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged. She said, Integrity is the recognition of the fact that you cannot fake your consciousness, just as honesty is the recognition that you cannot fake existence. That man is an indivisible entity, an integrated unit of two attributes, of matter and consciousness, and that he may permit no breach between body and mind, between action and thought, between his life and his convictions. That, like a judge impervious to public opinion, he may not sacrifice his convictions to the wishes of others, be it the whole of mankind shouting pleas or threats against him. Now I think you can see from this that Rand sounds the themes of, you, of, of unity that I just mentioned. You need integrity because you don't always do the things that you know you should. And you don't always feel what you think you should. And integrity reminds you that you should. Yes, every bit of you should. We'll be returning to these themes as the lecture continues. But first, I want to step back and look at more, a more fundamental issue that underlies the objectivist conception of moral integrity. Now, I was just saying that integrity is a value concerned with maintaining one's unity. But this is only morally important because of a related basic unity, the unity of the moral and the practical. Many ethical systems regard integrity as impractical. And this is because they think that virtue in general is impractical. I mean, for most ethical systems, this make, makes a kind of sense on their own terms, because they don't expect morality to achieve any results outside of itself, at least not in the world as we know it. For example, if you think that virtue is its own reward, as the ancient Stoics did, then you'll be indifferent as to whether virtue yields you worldly success. 
I mean, the point of being virtuous in that view would just be to have the peace of mind or to experience the inherent value that comes from being virtuous. And the epitome of, this, the vir of virtue in this view was dying well. It was the epitome of virtue. So similarly, if you believe that virtue is rewarded in a supernatural paradise, then you'll be indifferent to whether virtue yields any results here in this world. In fact, you might expect that it won't yield results here in this world. But objectivism is, as Ayn Rand said, a philosophy for living on earth, on this earth, in this life. Virtue exists not for its own sake, but to promote your personal survival and happiness. Thus, the purpose of ethics is to guide a human being in achieving happiness in life. This means that the moral is the practical. And conversely, what is practical is moral. A morality conceived apart from its practical impact on human life would be useless. And a personal commitment to such a code would be pointless. If you saw a mechanic trying to fix a car and failing because the instructions in his manual didn't work, you wouldn't insist that he stick with those instructions, would you? If you heard of an elegant, oh, attractive scientific theory, but it just didn't fit the solid, confirmed experimental evidence, you wouldn't ignore the evidence to save the theory, would you? If your doctor prescribed a medicine for you that didn't cure your illness, you wouldn't keep taking it, would you? But that's exactly what most people do with ethical ideas. They just take it for granted that being ethical will involve contradictions and impracticalities. They try to be ethical and end up frustrated and unhappy and then keep trying the same ways of doing things. They keep their ethical chemotherapy, suffering the toxic effects, for the dubious benefit of getting praise from others. So to summarize, moral theories should be judged by their practical effects. And any consistent practical method of gaining values should be part of morality. The virtue of integrity is a commitment to living as a unified being, of putting theory into practice and putting moral ideals into action in practical life. But you may wonder, what does it mean to be practical? I mean, practical in what context? Now consider, if you're a scout for the army advancing into hostile territory, it might be most practical to have a shoot on sight policy for anyone you see, or at least anyone you see holding a gun. But what if you're visiting a gun show instead? Then that wouldn't be such a practical policy. And then there are those philosophers who, who are going to try to throw you for a loop by asking you how your morality is supposed to work out in really weird situations. Like, what if you were imprisoned with 20 other people by an evil dictator? This is a famous thought experiment in ethics. I have to warn you. What if you were imprisoned with 20 other people by an evil dictator? For kicks, El Jefe has ordered that a member of your group must die, though all of you are innocent. Now, here's your deep moral dilemma. You're the only one with a gun. Who should you shoot, yourself or one of the others? I hope you're consulting your moral intuitions right now because this is the kind of problem you're going to face through the rest of your lives. Well, if you're living the kind of life where you're not usually asked to murder one of your friends or shoot yourself in the head, uh, it might be wise to just realize that morality doesn't have to solve this kind of weird what-if problem. It has to solve problems that you can reasonably expect to encounter in the normal context of life. There may be some subcontexts that change what is right to do, in normal peacetime life, one would be very, very cautious before using a weapon on someone else. One should attack another only in self-defense or in defense of someone you know to be an innocent victim. But in wartime, the right policy is different because the situation is radically different. And objective morality is an absolute code of conduct. Because, but this is because reason is an absolute. But the truth of morality, like all truth, is always absolute relative to a certain context. You could call this moral relativity if you wanted, but let's be clear, it's not moral relativism. In any given context, there is a right way and a wrong way to act. So, so, so one should identify the context one is in and then act as moral principles indicate would be best to act, at least insofar as one wants to achieve life and happiness. Now, generally in this lecture, 
I'm only going to be speaking of moral principles that apply in the normal context of life. They apply with some culturally appropriate adaptation in Tahiti, Topeka, and Timbuktu. But they don't apply to war fighting, and they don't apply to weird, cooked up scenarios only a sadist would ever implement, and only someone disinterested in real moral problems would ever waste time considering. So that's the point that the moral is the practical. Now, let's take a look at what the virtue of integrity means in practice. I said earlier that integrity means basically wholeness. And essentially, the virtue of integrity means wholeness as well, wholeness of one's thoughts and one's actions. In particular, I'd like to discuss two aspects uh, in which we need this essential or basic kind of integrity or wholeness. This is, in our commitment to acting for our values on the one hand, and uh, in our commitment to acting for our knowledge on the other. Let's look first at integrity towards our values. <clears throat> Ayn Rand characterized value as that which one acts to gain and or keep. Now, we may quibble a bit as to whether this is a satisfactory definition. For example, do we value a beautiful house we admire as we drive by? Well, I mean, perhaps we do, at least insofar as we contemplate its beauty and think of it as a model for a house we might have sometime or think of it as something we might imitate. But Rand intended by her characterization of value as that one, which one acts to gain and or keep, to emphasize action. Her point was that idle wishes hardly counted as values. To merely think or say that you value something is often not really to value it at all. The George Bush Jr. administration said it valued lower government expenditure, but its budgets included huge increases year after year with plenty of pork barrel goodies to go around to every district in Congress. That, I think, showed a lack of integrity. Similarly, if I say to myself, I want to make more money, but then I do nothing to find a higher paying job or to pr improve my professional skills, I have a problem of integrity. It may be that I sincerely want to make more money and that, I'm, and that I'm depressed by my financial circumstances. But if that were true, I would need to make my actions suit my values in order to ease my mind, get out of my depression, and get my life moving again. It isn't then that you aren't sincerely fond of the kind of values you wish for but don't really act to gain. It's just that you aren't valuing them. You're not trying to use them to support your life and happiness. And so they aren't really full-fledged values for you. So if you find yourself wishing for things that you aren't doing anything to gain, you'd be well advised to heal the breach within yourself by doing one of two things. To either commit yourself to those goals as real values or recognize that they are not goals, at least not yet anyway. It'll save you a lot of idle wishing. So basically, integrity towards your values means showing that you value people and things by, by treating them like values. If you love someone, you don't forget their birthday. If you really want to be a writer, you start writing regularly. Valuing is something you do. It's not just a thought you have. Now, we experience our values psychologically in the form of emotions. For example, if you complete a project at work, and win a raise thereby, the money is your existential reward. But psychologically, you'll feel an emotion of satisfaction at your accomplishment. Our emotions reflect our subconscious value judgments. So our emotional responses to situations derive from subconscious estimations of what is good or bad, admirable or despicable, safe or dangerous. And by and large, we know what we value. That is, we can think for a minute and say, I value such and such. I mean, I had and emotionally enjoyed sushi for lunch, and I know that I like sushi. You know, it's like that. But say, for example, that as I came up to the podium to speak today, I felt a great, confident thrill come upon me. That would be my emotional experience of delight in public speaking. I might have known about it or expected it. Uh, I'm sorry, I might not have known about it or expected it. That is, I might have come up thinking, oh, it's uh, just another day I'm giving a talk, and then I'm excited. It surprised me. 
and my emotion would have revealed something about my inner self. And in this way, we're sometimes surprised by what moves us. Uh, another experience of mine was that there was a whole spate of movies some years ago based on Jane Austen's books. And like a lot of people, these books got me reading Austen and other books from and related to her period. And one reason, at least for me, was that I was surprised by the admiration I felt for the manners and attention to moral comportment that Austen's characters exhibit. And the peer, people from the period of the Regency period or the early 19th century exhibit. And I, it's something that I, it was a feature of life in her class in her period. And I suppose I thought I would have found the novel stuffy, but instead they made me think about values I had missed in my own upbringing. Now as a matter of personal wholeness, you need to develop emotional inclinations that are in tune with your rational judgments. That's a, that's a matter of personal wholeness. But as a matter of the virtue of integrity, you need to act in general harmony with your emotional dispositions. This is emotional integrity. Emotional integrity guards us against failing to live engaged with our values. It means we don't normally do things just because we think they're right. We do them because we feel it in our gut. Now, emotions are not items of knowledge. They're not. They're a sign of how we subconsciously evaluate something. And that subconscious evaluation may be true or false. You may have an irrational fear of dogs, for example, because a dog attacked you when you were a child. And to overcome that, you'd have to learn to get close to dogs again, though your subconscious is dead set against it. So you need a policy of not being led around by your emotions. That's an aspect of objectivity, which is a sub-virtue of rationality. And you need to recognize and accept your emotions. That's an application of integration, another sub-virtue of rationality. But you also need a policy of living in terms of your personal values. And your emotions are often the best guide to the whole you. When you recognize a surprising emotion in yourself, you really have work to do. Emotional integrity is a commitment to doing that work. I mean, you may determine that your emotion is due to irrational premises. In that case, you may or may not be able to change the subconscious attitudes that cause the emotion. Doing that may be a bit like uh, what one does to acquire a virtue. We'll be coming back to that process later in the talk. It, more often, however, your emotions aren't irrational. Surprising emotions or feelings, you, uh, or feelings you've repressed or neglected often reflect deeply held personal values that you should be taking account of. You may find fresh direction in life this way, or fresh sources of happiness. Or perhaps by attending to your emotions, you may discover what has been making you unhappy in your work or in a relationship or in the place where you live. The goal of emotional integrity is to keep your actions generally in harmony with your emotional dispositions and the personal values that they reflect. Do the things that turn you on. Avoid activities that turn you off. Don't let your emotions color your rational judgment and don't be led around simply by your feelings, but don't confuse yourself about what really gives you pleasure and what you really value. After all, happiness is the moral purpose of life. Maintaining the emotional integrity that happiness requires is therefore definitely a virtue. Now funny, isn't it? I mean, after all, part of being, the art of being happy is, uh, well, to allow yourself to be happy. Now, while emotional integrity is a way of being true to your personal values, uh, Ayn Rand described another form of integrity towards values. Or at least, this is how I understand the meaning of a brief passage she wrote. Uh, which is what uh, this is. Uh, the aspect of integrity in question is, is courage. Rand's discussion of courage occurs in Atlas Shrugged at the end of her summary of the virtue in, of integrity in John Galt's speech. She says there that integrity is the recognition that courage and confidence are practical necessities. That courage is the practical form of being true to existence, of being true to truth, and that confidence is the practical form of being true to one's own consciousness. Now, in fact, Rand mentions two aspects of integrity here, courage, as I mentioned, and also confidence. But of these, just one is a case of integrity towards values. That's courage. I say this even though Rand uh, doesn't mention values in her description. But she says that courage pertains to existence. That courage is the practical form of being true to existence. And I think by existence here, Rand means one's existence in reality, or one's life and its requirements, that is, one's values. 
So I want to discuss courage first as a form of integrity towards values, and I'll come back to confidence second. Now, what is courage? Courage is a policy of acting on one's values in the face of the risk of harm. Acting on one's values in the face of the risk of harm. People commonly associate courage with overcoming fear. Courageous firefighters, for example, charge into a burning building where most people would run away in terror. But the reason we feel fear is because consciously or subconsciously, we're aware of a potential danger. If you're on a hike, for example, and you see a brown bear come out onto your path, you're likely to feel a spurt of fear. But why is that? Because it must be because some part of you thinks the bear might attack you. You fear the risk of harm. And notice that in the case of firefighters, their courage may have nothing to do with fear. I mean, firefighters are trained in their jobs. They know fire and handle its risks like professionals. They may feel no fear at all in most cases. That doesn't make them uncourageous. Their courage consists in pursuing their profession in the face of its risks. So it's not the emotion necessarily that you feel, but the actual characteristics of the deed that matter. Now it's foolhardy, it's it genuinely, it's, it's silly to step into danger for no good reason. But on the other hand, life is just simply risky. You take a risk when you cross the street and people do get run over all the time, according to super freakonomics, especially when they're drunk. You take a risk when you eat a sandwich. People get food poisoning all the time. It's a virtue to act for your values despite the risks. Of course, the greater the values at stake, the greater the risks worth running, and then the greater courage you need. I mean, it doesn't take much courage to cross the street, but it takes a lot of courage to stake your financial future on a new business idea, or to quit a safe job to pursue a better career, or to go off and fight a battle, for that matter. Courage is thus a kind of integrity towards your values. The other aspect of integrity that Rand mentions in this passage is confidence. Now, if I understand what Rand is saying here, confidence is a policy of holdings, holding to one's judgment in the face of one's own fallibility. So as a feeling, confidence is the sense that one is competent, that I can do it. As an aspect of integrity, it's holding to one's knowledge that one can, of what one can do or of what, one, of what can be done. And even though others may say, how can you be sure? You're confident when you're decisive, when you follow through on your decisions. But any act we take based on the knowledge we have in this, in, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, any act we take is based on the knowledge we have of the situation. And it's a fact of reality that any knower is limited by his context and by the time he has to reach a decision. I think a good example of confidence in this case was the attitude of Frank Lloyd Wright when he used his own radical new design for the structural columns of the Johnson Wax Building in Racine, Wisconsin. Everyone wondered how could he be so sure his newfangled columns would work. Uh, these are the columns that uh, go up as a slender uh, a round column and then they spread out really wide. And it was a radical design of his that had immense load bearing capabilities. And everyone wondered how could he be so sure his newfangled columns would work. So Wright called out newspapermen and he loaded up a test column in full public view. And in fact, he piled on well more weight than the columns would need to support in the real, in the <clears throat> real building. A collapse of the column would have dashed his reputation, but he didn't give in to the doubters. He could have been wrong, but he knew that he wasn't. And now, as I've said, courage is an aspect of integrity towards values, but confidence like that is not. Confidence is an aspect of integrity, uh, is an instance of integrity in acting on your knowledge. And that's what Rand seems to mean by referring to the requirements of, of consciousness. Thinking and producing knowledge is what consciousness does. So integrity towards knowledge is a different kind of basic integrity, uh, and I call it epistemological integrity. Epistem epistemology is, of course, the theory of knowledge. So epistemological integrity is integrity to do with knowledge. And confidence is an example of that. 
Now, what is knowledge exactly? So ob objectivism defines knowledge as an objective conceptual uh, grasp of the facts. One needs a policy of unifying theory and practice. Theories are broad explanatory principles, but here theory stands for abstract knowledge itself. Complex and abstract ideas can usually only be proven through arguments that take many steps and involve many integrations. For example, how do you know that the germ disease of theory, uh, that the germ theory of disease is true? How do you know that the germ theory of disease is true? You can't just see the germs. Uh, sick people don't come with a label infected with germs. And we know it through a complex set of steps and inferences from what we see in microscopes to what different studies have done by reputable people to medicines that are based on the germ theory that work to confirmation tests that we use to test for different diseases that employ the germ theory. These are all these different ways, but all of these involve an immense amount of abstractions. Now, real theories are true. Real theories work in practice. But we all know of beliefs people have that don't work in practice or that they never try in practice. A flat earth theory, for example, you can't use it to get to the moon. Communism, funny how it always works out in oppression, misery, and poverty. It is always tempting to believe that something, uh, that something is good because it sounds good, or to espouse beliefs because they sound good to others. Because of this, there are two key principles to epistemological integrity besides confidence. One of these I call non-hypocrisy. It consists in holding to abstractions that are in keeping with one's actions. Uh, a hypocrite is someone who doesn't practice what they preach. A person of integrity doesn't preach what he doesn't practice and doesn't fail to practice what he preaches, not to mention putting into practice what he believes to be right and true. For example, a hypocrite might live in the city but bemoan the quality of urban life. A person of integrity who lives in the city knows why he lives there. He knows it must have some good qualities or he must have made a terrible mistake. A hypocrite might rationalistically think of himself as an advocate of pride and personal achievement. But instead of putting his values into action by taking initiative in his life, he's mostly a cranky cocktail party companion. He argues for his beliefs, but he isn't living them. If one is not to be a hypocrite, it is also necessary, however, to connect abstract ideas with their practical implications and with each other. And so epistemological integrity also requires, I think, what I call intellectual seriousness, which is my term for taking seriously the practical implications of one's ideas. See, because integrating your ideas with the rest of your knowledge is an aspect of rationality, of course. And the point here is to integrate them with your goals and actions. A person of rationality doesn't espouse false ideas. And a person of integrity tries to preach and live by the same ideas. The value of philosophy itself is that it integrates ideas across all domains of knowledge, and at best gives you guidance you can act on practically. So uh, epistemological integrity uh, employs, uh, so philosophy itself and implying, uh, applying one's philosophy is an aspect of intellectual seriousness. So epistemological integrity consists in confidence, intellectual seriousness, and non-hypocrisy. Act with confidence on your knowledge and don't doubt where you don't have reason to. And hold to ideas you can live by and live by the ideas to which you can hold. Okay, we've seen now that to be a person of integrity is to stand by your values. If you love someone, you show them that you love them. You don't just ignore them. You need to act for your values or else you aren't acting at all. And acting for your values also means acting for what makes you happy. Doing the kinds of things you like to do is living an integrated life. That's integrity towards values. And similarly, you need integrity in your ideas. Be confident of your judgment if you have reason to be. Put your theory of life into practice and take responsibility for putting your money where your mouth is. Don't be a hypocrite and systematize your view of life so you can act on it consistently. So that, all that said, now we turn to integrity as the virtue of being a principled person. We'll see that being principled is key to what it means, uh, to what I meant by calling integrity the virtue of being virtuous. 
Now, I said that the theme of integrity is to put your ideas into action. To hold ideas you can act on, however, you need to think of them in terms of principles. And to guide your actions to their greatest effect, you need to act in accordance with principles. What are principles? I, in common parlance, we think of principles as central or important ideas. And speaking more formally, however, I would say that principles are abstractions that unite conceptual knowledge within a given domain, within a given area of knowledge. So that, uh, for example, there are principles of physics, such as Newton's laws and Maxwell's equations and so on. And there are principles of economics, like supply and demand and monetary theory and so on. There are also principles of medicine, principles of engineering, principles of dance, principles of public speaking, and so on. Now, all the principles worth the name are absolute because they're true. But principles are also contextual. They apply to certain situations and not to others, and it requires judgment to know how to apply them. Principles are crucial to thinking and to putting our thoughts into action because they unite and summarize a huge amount of information. Armed with a relatively few key principles, we can hold a vast context in mind and solve complicated problems and achieve great values. Now, the principles that matter most for the virtue of integrity are the principles for living. In other words, moral principles. Moral principles are essential to guiding human action because they unite our knowledge of the full effects. Uh, uh, they unite our knowledge of the full range of actions open to human cho choice. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, objective moral principles identify the kinds of goals and actions that advance one's long-term life and happiness in the normal context of life. Like principles generally, objective moral principles are absolute and contextual. Whatever your situation, objective moral principles will give you at least some reliable guidance on the best course to take. It's not an algorithm. They're not rules, and it's not an algorithm. But they will give you guidance on the best uh, route to take. There's a real difference between what is right and what is wrong for you. And your moral principles will condense that information into a highly compact form. And when we act virtuously, we act as we judge those absolute and contextual principles to apply. So one good way of describing virtue is to say that a virtue is a consistent policy of applying moral principles in action. For example, is it right for you to make the effort to think through your problems? Or should you just ignore them and hope they'll go away? The principles of rationality apply here. You ought to think things through. Should you feel guilty about being more comp a more competent worker than your friend, or about the fact that you're better looking than your siblings. The principles of pride apply here. Don't accept unearned guilt, and don't apologize for your virtues or for being who you basically are. Now, the virtue of integrity is the virtue of acting in accordance with principles. In other words, integrity is a policy of, having, of acting on one's own principles. Integrity is the virtue of putting one's principles, and especially one's moral principles, into action. And integrity is also the policy of making sure one's actions comport with one's principles. It's part of the general unity of theory and practice that we talked about as epistemological integrity. In this way, integrity is a commitment to uniting moral theory with moral practice. And in this sense, it's the virtue of being principled. But since any policy of acting in accordance with moral principles is a virtue, integrity is, in effect, the virtue of acting virtuously. It's the virtue of virtuousness. I suppose you all know that Ayn Rand's least favorite philosopher was Immanuel Kant. Of the things that Rand disliked about Kant's influence on later philosophy, his view of moral rules certainly stands out. For Kant, the basic purpose of ethics was to provide us with acontextual duties, rules that apply to us regardless of our needs or situation. Many religions have seen the purpose of ethics this way too. Consider the Ten Commandments, for example. Thou shalt not. Well, which thou? Why every one of thou in thy every single situation? Duty-based ethics provide us with a list of rules to follow. 
goodness then consists in applying with the, with, in complying with the list of rules. Objectivism, by contrast, is an ethics based in values. It identifies the type of values that advance human life and happiness. But even so, many key values for each of us are personal. So the things we ought to pursue are different for each of us. I mean, you might value one house, and uh, she might value another. Uh, I might value that apartment, and you might value that car, whereas I might value the scooter, and so on. We can abstract some universal, moral, some universal principles of ethics, but principles are not rules. Because rules apply without regard for context. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, does not appear to allow for exceptions. I mean, people make exceptions, but there's nothing about thou shalt not kill that allows for exceptions. Principles, by contrast, are contextual. Which ones apply and what they mean depends on who you are and what your situation is. The application of rules is transparent. It's pretty obvious what thou shalt not kill means. It's a very bright line and straightforward requirement. But the application of principles requires judgment. You have to relate the context to the principle. When you feel a strong emotion, for example, you have to know whether you need to apply the principle of objectivity and resist emotionalism, or if you should apply the principle of emotional integrity and explore the personal values that the emotion reflects. Knowing the difference requires judgment and sensitivity to the context. Rule-based ethics are also known as deontological ethics. Whatever the word, duty or deontology, objectivism rejects the very idea of moral rules. The choice to live is a commitment to values, and values aren't compatible with out-of-context duties. Thus, integrity, as a commitment to acting on principle, stands against the acceptance of moral duties. Now, in our culture, the common alternative to following moral rules is pragmatism and expediency. And people either follow deontolo deontological rules mostly, or they're just pretty unprincipled. Pragmatism is the philosophy of doing whatever works, but it's associated with the rejection of any absolute knowledge or principles. So as the old joke goes, the only problem with pragmatism is that it doesn't work. Our moral principles identify our values and the means to them over the long range. So moral principles cover the full length of life and the full breadth of different tastes, personalities, sexes, professions, races, and other traits. You can use moral principles if you're a 60-year-old woman in Sheboygan, and you can use moral principles if you're a 16-year-old girl in Waltham. Moral principles are contextual, but don't forget that they're absolute, too. Using them, you can identify what's right and wrong for you in the full context of your life. But people who act pragmatically and expediently, uh, people who act pragmatically and expediently rarely look far beyond the range of the moment. And how could they? I mean, the future is complicated. You never know how your life might change. You could die tomorrow. Better to get what we can get right now. People who act expediently also compromise their values. It's pragmatic for a president who advocates free trade to slap tariffs on the steel industry for the sake of a few union dues. It's expedient for a company to cheapen its products. Think of the boost to quarterly profits, never mind the long-term impact on the company's reputation. Pragmatism doesn't work because we don't just live in the moment. We can know what the right thing to do is, and we don't benefit from compromising on our principles because our principles summarize the truth or else they're just not principles. No one in their right mind tries to compromise on the principles of physics, but somehow everyone thinks they can get away with compromising on their moral principles. We need the virtue of integrity to strengthen us against the temptation to short-termism, pragmatism, and expediency. You can't mix oil and water and expect to be able to cook french fries, and you can't mix poison with your food and expect to be nourished, and you can't mix evil with good or life with death. Each compromise is a little death. It's a little more of our life or values that we give away for no real benefit. We need integrity to avoid compromising our values. Does this mean we shouldn't ever take immediate pleasures? Well, of course not. 
Does it mean that we should never negotiate deals with others or alter a plan of action to accommodate it uh, to the circumstances? No, of course it doesn't. But it means we should take pleasures in keeping with our general principles and not at the price of values we prize more. We should be happy to negotiate win-win uh, business deals from which we stand to benefit. And plans can change as needed as long as the changes are in keeping with the values and principles behind the plan. The point is your integrity is a commitment to your values though the impl implementation of your principles uh, through the implementation of your principles in action. Your principles identify what you should do and integrity is your policy of actually doing it. One hallmark of a person of integrity is consistency. When one acts on principle, one acts in a consistent manner. Another source of personal consistency is one's character. Character uh, consists in one's dispositions and habits. What we tend to describe as character is the whole set of deep-seated habits and characteristic patterns of behavior that make each of us a distinctive personality. Habits can be little ticks, like the habit of chewing on your fingernails. One's dispositions are just one's normal patterns of acting. They're called dispositions because they're how one is disposed to act. Some, uh, someone might have an honorable disposition and be quick to make recompense for any harms that they did or accept any just blame for their shortcomings. A person with an honorable disposition would tend to be honorable as a kind of super habit. They would tend to act honorably just as a matter of course. So one's character is the way one acts automatically. And that's because dispositions and habits are subconscious. This is, most, uh, this is obvious in most habits. I mean, the trouble with habits, after all, is that we often do them without thinking. If you ever tried to stop biting your nails, you know exactly what I mean. Hence the frustration of gener generations of women over the way most men leave the toilet seat up. It's something those blighters just do without thinking. Really. On a personal level, and so for nail biting and other simple habits, they're hard to change because we do them without thinking. Now dispositions are subconscious too. Uh, a man predisposed to anger would be the sort who would often get mad for little reason. A man for whom anger was a habitual response. We often speak of people's moods as dispositions. She has a cheery disposition. He has a gloomy disposition and so on. And that makes sense because our background moods are part of our emotional makeup and one that is least amenable, amenable really, to any conscious control. You can repress an emotion, for example, but it's hard to repress your characteristic mood. Now, the important point here is that the virtue of integrity is vital for the formation and maintenance of a good character. A good character consists of moral habits and virtues. And moral habits are those that implement applications of moral virtues. In other words, moral habits are ways we put moral principles into very practical action. You know, for example, maybe doing logic exercises might be a good moral habit for developing one's rationality. A habit of recognizing the birthdays of all one's friends could be a good way of practicing civility and sensitivity. A habit of cleaning house once a week could be a means of practicing cleanliness, and so on. There can be as many moral habits as there are useful ways to implement the virtues or to seek values. Now, virtues themselves are like great general moral habits. A virtue, is that part of one's uh, a virtue that is part of one's character is really just a disposition to act in accordance with the relevant principle. Now, you may ask, aren't principles uh, the policies of action by which we gain and keep values? And aren't virtues policies of action in accordance with moral principles? And the answer is yes. And we might add that in Atlas Shrugged, uh, Ayn Rand calls virtues recognitions of certain facts. So their, their principles, their policies of action, their policy of acting in accordance with moral principles, their recognitions, their dispositions, virtues. That's all true of virtues. They're all those things, if you look at them from different angles. Virtues are policies of acting that we follow knowingly on the basis of the recognition of certain facts, putting objective moral principles into action. When these policies of action become incorporated into the subconscious, then they become dispositions, ways in which we act without much thought. For example, pride is a policy of taking credit and responsibility for achieving one's own happiness by assessing one's competence and moral worth 
uh, and the moral worth of one's goals. Now, if you weren't brought up in a reflective moral tradition or religion, you might reflect on your actions haphazardly, relying on a native basic self-esteem to get you up in the morning and carry you over the bumps. And you might react with defensive self-justifications or inchoate remorse when things don't go well. And you might react by bragging or feeling false and inadequate when you succeed and are praised by others. But now consider how different it would be if you had a habit of acting on the principle of pride, a disposition. What if you made it part of your day to reflect on what you had achieved and where you'd fallen short? If this had become a habit of moral hygiene, just as brushing your teeth is a habit of dental hygiene, then you would do it regularly as part of your routine. After months and years of doing this, you now face moments of stress and praise with the balance of a robust self-esteem rooted in your real traits, your real worth, and your real accomplishments. That's having a virtue. It means living the principle rather than merely knowing what it means. So subconscious dispositions, however, can only be changed or developed through consistent practice. To act consistently, one must act in accordance with a principle. And there's integrity. Integrity is the policy of acting in accordance with principles. Integrity is the patient practice that yields virtue over time. Earlier in the talk, I discussed emotional integrity, and I said that once we understood character better, we would understand better how we might deal with emotional dispositions we conclude are irrational. Or, for that matter, if we conclude we need a positive emotional disposition for something. Well, just as through consistency and practice we can develop or change habits and build a strong moral character, so too we can change many, not all, but many emotional dispositions through conscious, consistent attention to the reasons why we hold values that are at odds with our received emotions. Usually over time, this changes the emotional inclination, but this won't change moods or other deep-seated emotional inclinations. So in conclusion, let me say that unity as a living being is the theme of integrity being a being of unified mind and body, for whom the moral is the practical, who needs a harmony of reason and emotion, that's emotional integrity, who needs to put theory into practice, that's epistemological integrity, and finally it unites principles and action, that's the policy of integrity, putting principles into action. Thank you. I have no idea how much time we have for questions, but I'm grateful for any questions you may have. If you could use the mic, um, uh, that would be appreciated. If I understood you correctly, you said that integrity is both the policy of acting in accordance with the principle and the disposition that one thereby develops that then leads one to do so without having to do the same kind of conscious effort. A very Aristotelian idea um, that we can act in accordance with a disposition or with what a disposition would tell us before we have that disposition. But it seems then as if if we call both aspects of that the virtue of integrity, one can have a virtue and not have a virtue at the same time having the virtue in the sense of consciously recognizing that this is the policy one ought to fulfill, having the virtue in the sense of deliberately and with effort and perhaps painfully following that policy, and not have it in the sense that it is still painful and it is still an effort. Isn't that a contradiction? Hey, that's a very good point, and it's not a contradiction. Uh, it just means there's degrees of having virtue and uh, obviously um, your moral life is better centered and uh, more fixed if you've developed a set of dispositions that are in, in accord with your moral principles. But they have to be careful about those dispositions because you can have dispositions to vice just as you can have dispositions to virtue. So what makes them virtues is not that they're dispositions so much as that they follow the correct moral principle. And it's, in the end, acting on the correct moral principle that's the essence of being virtuous. And developing the disposition is a deepening and a uh, enriching of what it is to know and practice that virtue and can make it more easy. 
But I would say it's knowing, not only knowing what the principle means, but following it in action. That is, employing integrity itself is of the essence to having any virtue at all. You couldn't have any virtue at all if you didn't, in essence, follow the policy of integrity towards principles. And uh, so I would say that the, it's the having the policy that's the, that's the, the essence. Um, Peter. Yes. Um, I often try to explain uh, objectivist principles to non-objectivists. And one of the things I have most, uh, I have quite a bit of difficulty with is using the word absolute uh, to describe principles you use in your talk. Um, do you have some, can you unpack that a little bit? Are there other words one could use to, de to describe what absolute means in that context uh, as opposed to whatever? Sure. I think what objectivism means by absolute principles could could stretch from what one might call a rule of thumb. That is to say, something that one knows applies in a complex situation with a high degree of probability of working, but one's aware you know, it doesn't always quite cash out right. Um, eh, I, know, I won't go into examples on that. They would get complicated. But, but generally, what we're looking for in principles are uh, are uh, propositions that unite the knowledge of a whole field or a big sub-area of a field and tell us something that's true so that what the abstraction says we can rely on in dealing with that field. Um, the, the absolute is a, a result of something I was talking about in the previous lecture on rationality that our uh, rational judgment and conclusions that we've logically reached are absolute because they conserve uh, in our thinking the identity uh, that exists in the things themselves. And so they're, they're, there's nothing wishy-washy about well-founded knowledge or principles that are really based in the fact, in the facts. But, you know, I'm not saying that any principle you make up or any statement you say and that you state with conviction is now uh, applies absolutely. People also, I was, I was careful in this lecture to try and combine whenever I said absolute with the word contextual because this is an error, an error people often make. They often use the word absolute to mean acontextual. Applies to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in every possible situation, all time and all space and, and everything. Um, but um, uh, that's not the sense, if, in epistemology nothing is absolute in that way because you're never omniscient and no one ever will be. Uh, so that all your, all your knowledge is founded in a context of knowledge you have and it's absolute relative to that context of knowledge. The classic example of this, it, uh, when I talk about this more, is, the, is Newton's laws of, of, uh, of motion and uh, the physics of Einstein. People often say that Einstein overthrew Newton, and it's not true. Newton's a limiting case in the equations of Einstein, and in the velocities that Newton was treating, Newton is correct. And so Newton's principles were absolute. They are absolute, and they remain absolute in their context. If you want to study the flight of a cannonball, go with Newton. It's fine. If you're interested in uh, uh, behaviors and of uh, of, uh, uh, of objects moving at near luminal speeds, near the speed of light, you need Einstein. And Newton just wasn't addressing that. And he wasn't, didn't have the evidence to address it. So that one of the wonderful things about contextual knowledge is that when you expand the context, you don't dump what you knew before in your more limited context. It doesn't become untrue. I mean, if it was true in the first place, it was true because it corresponded to the facts, some facts. Those facts didn't go away. You know, they may have become historical or something, but they, they didn't go away. Uh, and when you expanded the context, and maybe you came up with a more rich understanding, the way Einstein's is richer than, than Newton's, you added something. You didn't destroy what was already known. Science only destroys stuff that we thought we knew when we didn't know it in the first place. You know? Uh, one of the problems with uh, human action uh, is that People often say uh, hindsight is 2020. They they perform certain actions. They make certain certain judgments, and and at the time it seems like that is a practical thing to do. But then later, 
looking back, it turns out that no, that wasn't the practical thing, thing to do. And in those cases, which often happen, it's although it's clear in your in in the in the writing, I was I'm not sure whether or not Rand's ethics regarding this actually deals with the issue of. Um, uh, well, hindsight is twenty twenty. That things happen that you cannot see coming, and that after it happens, then you can look back and you see that no, that was a wrong course to take. And then what do you? What is one to do? Because, or for example, let's say just marriage. For example, let's say it turns out that doesn't turn out so hot, you know. And, but you are now you have kids, you have a career, and so on. Yeah. I'm no friends in that situation. Um, uh, fortunately, not me, not yet. Um, the sure we don't. We're not omniscient, and most of the activities we do, um, in fact, the vast majority of the knowledge we have is probabilistic in one way or another, or involves complex situations um, like uh, the weather where we don't know and can't, it's be unlikely to ever know what the exact pattern is going to be. And um, human activity where free will's involved, so God knows, you know, there are patterns, but you can never quite be sure what people are going to do. Um, and in those cases, you exercise your best judgment, you employ the best principles you have, and you uh, have to act on the best knowledge you have or recognize you just don't have enough knowledge to act reasonably. But in those cases, you could be wrong, right? And then you need a practice of trying to examine how you went wrong and how you could improve. That's certainly part of pride and taking pride in your past and assessing your, your actions. Hey, does that answer your question about hindsight? I mean, yes, there's a problem that people look at. There's also an error of hindsight. You know, people tend to look at the past and say, oh, well, it was all clear now how it would have been, and they tend to forget what the context of uh, life would be. I'd love to, you know, know the number of people who can show evidence that they said there was a property bubble in 2005. You know, now everyone says they, you know, they knew it was a bubble, but... Well, that, that often happens. Hindsight, is, as, as being 2020, is not is something when you're looking back and now you see problems that you didn't that, that you did not see coming up and that revolves a certain amount of psychological gymnastics shall we say uh, but nevertheless what I'm trying to say is and I'm not saying that we have a, a solution for it but people people make moral choices as in for example marriage or career whatever and then they're heavily involved and then it's not so easy it's not as easy as Rand says to to walk out and do something else um, I don't know that Iran said it was easy. Um, you know, it's not, the, it's not easy to change a big life course or undo major life events. Right. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you all. Uh, we'll be back here with productiveness tomorrow.